So I'll hand over now to Professor Simon Rule. So Simon is a clinical haematologist from Plymouth in the United Kingdom, who is out here uh, as a, a guest speaker at a, our National Haematology Society meeting. Um, Simon's main interest is in mantle cell lymphoma, which is one of the, the important subtypes of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He has a publication list the, long, uh, the length of your arm, so very, you know, a very important person in the lymphoma space. Um, and as of this year, is now the Deputy President of the uh, British Society of Haematology. So we're great, very grateful that in the context of what is an incredibly busy itinerary that he has, that um, somewhat at the last moment he's volunteered to help us out today. So thank you very much, Simon. I know it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I do a lot for the Lymphoma Association in the UK, and I think it's the most valuable organisation we have. Uh, it's all very well patients talking to me about side effects and what have you, but talking to people that have gone through it's far more useful. Just to reassure you as well, let me show you that I am, I am one of you, right? <laughs> well, almost one of you, okay. <laughs> I've got a bit of both. So um, I am part Australian trained. I'm not sure that's going to reassure anybody. Um, I've decided not to show any slides either because what, what I find is that um, when we doctors show so presentations, we show slides of things like survival curves, which actually aren't terribly... They're a bit emotive for patients to see that kind of thing, and I don't think that's terribly helpful. So rather just talk about the generality of lymphoma, where the treatments are, and, and where the future's going to be. So I have a very peculiar practice. I just do lymphoma for a living. So I work in a big hospital with a big catchment area, and I have a lymphoma clinic for all lymphomas. And then I have this subspecious interest in mantle cell lymphoma, which is a very rare type. And Jason's right, the incidence of lymphoma is going up. And what's even more confusing, of course, is there's over 70 different types, which makes it even more confusing for everybody. Um, so yes, I have mantle cell lymphoma interest, and within that, we do lots of new drugs. So all the kind of new drugs that you read about and hear about, I've probably used most of them. And one of the kind of recurring themes uh, when I'm talking to, not so much patients, I think, to my colleagues, is there's a, there's a real appetite for some of these new drugs, and everybody's very excited about these new drugs. And uh, I just reassure, remind people that chemotherapy works, and it works in, in lots of different types of lymphoma, and of course cures the commonest type of lymphoma. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, some of these new drugs might, in the future, change the, the paradigm for some of these diseases. But I've certainly had conversation, I had one, I was telling Jason, a conversation with a patient literally this last week who was very reluctant to have chemotherapy for her diffuse large B cell, which has a 70% chance of curing her, because she was worried about what was going to happen 10 years down the track. And the reality is there is no 10 years down the track unless she gets treated. So sometimes, you know, we have to read, remind people that the treatments we've got, whilst they appear you know, unpleasant and for some patients, toxicities are an issue, uh, short-lived and, and hopefully you, know, you, you, you get over it and you're back to normal. So with these new drugs, there is certainly, uh, in some diseases, certainly the disease I manage, particularly mantle cell lymphoma, we've got these new oral therapies which look really very very good and that may well change some of the treatment paradigms but for many lymphomas that won't be the case. <clears throat> so um, I've used almost all these new drugs now uh, and there is, the, there is a transformation away from what people would consider con conventional or, or traditional chemotherapy towards non-chemotherapy type approaches uh, and I, I think one of the things that's a bit difficult to get your head around is what's chemotherapy, what's not chemotherapy. Some of these non-chemotherapy drugs kill cells and cause problems, that's chemotherapy in my book. So it's, it's sort of old-fashioned chemotherapy is what people are comparing with. And some of the new drugs have their own side effects. So they, just because it's not a chemotherapy doesn't mean it's not without its problems. Having said all that, things are certainly improving. There's no question. And if you look at the, the outcome in the disease I manage, you can see that the long-term outcomes of patients are getting better and better and better. And one of the dangers, I think, with the internet particularly, is you read things and patients come in terrified, saying, well, I'm, I'm, this is really bad, this is really bad. And actually, the reality is much better than that. So that's uh, one, of the, one of the good things, the bad things about the internet is it gives you information, but sometimes it's, uh, it's not necessarily the right, the, the right information. But if we talk specifically about my, the disease I treat, mantle cell lymphoma, because that's the one I know the most about, so here's an aggressive type, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Uh, here's an aggressive lymphoma that is on the face of an incurable disease. Sounds awful. Um, but within that, 
we recognise, and this is one of my research interests, about a third of patients don't need treating. You can just watch them. Now, that seems counterintuitive. If you've got a nasty type of lymphoma, you can watch it, and in some people it just jogs along in the background without anything. And it's not that they've been taking any particular herbal remedy or anything. That's just the way it is. So um, how do you... How do you work that out? So we've got a, in the UK, we've got a large study where we're just following people. And the idea is we're going to try and find some kind of marker at diagnosis that'll tell you whether somebody's disease is, is more aggressive or less aggressive. So I think understanding the biology of lymphomas is very important. And that will ultimately change our approach to management. Uh, and that might be being less intensive with treatment and in some situations being more intensive with treatment. So information is important. One of the challenges with lymphoma is, uh, is getting the diagnosis right, and uh, many of you won't, I guess, be aware of that, but uh, getting the diagnosis right at the beginning is very important, and, and certainly in, in, the, in the UK, I can tell you there's been a big push to centralisation of pathology services, because if, if it's, it's, you know, it's a general rule of medicine, if you see lots of something, you're going to be better at it than if you see not very much of something, so getting the diagnosis right in the first place is very important. And within that diagnosis, again, we're starting to understand certain prognostic factors, which right now may not make a difference to how we treat, but in the future probably will. So understanding patients whose disease is more aggressive and less aggressive, and then tailoring your treatment accordingly is important. Uh, as I said, in, in the disease I treat, we've got these new tablets. That's what I've just been talking about, actually. Drugs called BTK inhibitors. They're oral therapies. They've got really very well, very few in the way of side effects look highly active in patients after chemotherapy. And so, in, again, in the UK right now, we've got a trial comparing that treatment against chemotherapy as first-line treatment for lymphoma. So you're either getting chemotherapy, you're getting non-chemotherapy in the context of tablets. Unfortunately, Australia couldn't join that trial because your regulators don't allow subcutaneous, don't allow rituximab maintenance. If you did, you'd be in the trial as well. Um, actually, Australia and the UK share a lot of similarities around getting access to drugs. I think actually you're slightly slower than us, which reassures me because we're much slower than the rest of Europe. Um, and of course, we're, we're about to become out of Europe as well. It could make things even worse. But uh, anyway, so yeah, so these new drugs have the potential to change the whole treatment paradigm. And, and this study that, that we're running, we've got 150 patients in it now, half getting chemotherapy, half getting the, the tablets. Uh, the idea is to see whether it's as good, at least as good. And if it is, we know it's got a little, far fewer side effects. So it's about not just, is it, does it make you live longer, but in the process, are you, are you feeling much better? Have you got fewer side effects? So part of the equation is making people live as long as possible. That's true. The other, maybe more important thing, is having quality of life during that period of time. Um, you're too young to remember interferon, but uh, the drug we used to use a long time ago, interferon, used to, used to make people live a bit longer with certain hematological cancers. Uh, myeloma and follicular lymphoma actually but you felt awful awful so you know you it bought you time but the whole time you felt terrible so nobody uses that anymore so that balance between living longer and feeling feeling better in the process is important and a lot of that is is having an informed conversation with patients i think one of the one of the things i always find a bit frustrating because i see a lot of patients for second opinions is that their their original doctors never actually been terribly honest with the patient about what they're likely to achieve with the therapy, what the outcomes are going to be, and then they read things on the internet, they challenge the doctor, the doctor doesn't like the challenge, it all kind of falls apart, and, and they should never be like that. You know, I think if, as I always take the view that I'm going to tell you what I want my mum to know, or what I want my brother to know, and if you treat people like that, then that's the right way to go. So, um, yeah, so there are some, there's some very exciting things. Uh, you may be aware of this CAR T-cell therapy that's, that's coming for aggressive lymphomas. Uh, that's not been... There's few patients in Australia, very few people in the UK. It's predominantly happened in America. So this offers a whole new treatment paradigm, if you like. Uh, I'm a bone marrow transplanter by, by training, and CAR T cell, in a sense, is a, is, is a, is a bone marrow transplant without all the, the paraphernalia that goes along with it. And in certainly <coughs> aggressive lymphomas, it looks, it looks very, very interesting. So this is basically enhancing your own immune system to go back and target your tumour because your immune system's lost the ability to do that. That's why the tumor's there in the first place. Not without toxicity, of course. Uh, so all of these things, you don't get something for nothing. You start playing with your immune system, you can, get, you, can get, you can get toxicities. But as we get better at doing this, we understand how to manage that, then there's a, there's a definite prospect that uh, we can cure more patients, certainly with the aggressive lymphomas. But there's a challenge there um, for um, 
governments and regulators as to how you do that kind of thing. So in the UK right now, NICE has said yes to this form of therapy. Uh, but that has to be done in a very carefully regulated way. Only eight centres are going to be allowed to do it to start with, and they have to be inspected first, and then it'll get rolled out into a bigger number of centres. So when you put expensive and difficult therapies out there, you've got to put it in the hands of a small number of people so they get the experience. So one word of advice I'd give you, who's read um, Lance Armstrong's book, It's Not About the Bike? Anybody read that book? You read it? So... Um, he got, he got testicular cancer, and he got it in his brain and his lungs, and uh, he, 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 he was cured, basically. So I got this book. Somebody said, you should read that. It's really interesting. And he's, he's a bit mad. Um, uh, and he's clearly an obsessional uh, individual. And the reason he got where he got with the treatment was he found the best person. And that's, that's a very important message, I think, with, um, with certainly with, with, rare, with rare types of lymphoma. Go and find something that does it regularly. And... If you ask your doctor for a second opinion and they're very reluctant, you probably don't want them looking after you. A doctor that's happy to give you a second opinion is very confident in what they're doing. That's a good rule of thumb. Okay? Uh, and it might be that you're getting exactly the right thing, but sometimes you know, there might be things that, aren't, aren't, that you're not aware of that, uh, that are out there. It's not a controversial thing to say, is it? No. no, no. I think that applies with any rare disease, actually. Go and see somebody who does it for a living, and they're going to have more expertise than people that don't. Um, so that's important. Um, there are lots of things coming. Again, that I would just counsel people, you read some amazing stories on the internet and just be very cautious when you actually, that the reality sometimes isn't as, 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 as good as the, as the internet would tell you. Sometimes it is. Uh, and some of these, certainly the BTK inhibitors are, uh, are absolutely transforming the life, lifestyle, lifestyle of some of my patients. So um, rather than ramble on, I think it's always more useful if I answer questions, because I'm just sort of, you know, I'm a, I'm a generalist, but I'm just telling where I can talk about. Uh, and because, yeah, I mean, you'll have things you want me to, to talk about. One, one thing I would say is um, I'm not going to comment on anybody's individual treatment, because I won't know the whole story. So if you say a friend of mine's got this, I know that's not the case. So I, you know, I've done, I've done enough of these things to know, to know that. But I, <laughs> but I can talk in general about, you know, approaches or treatments or, or, or anything you want to talk about, actually. So... How, how, how do you want to play it? Oh, there we go. Um, go. I'm more interested in sort of healing trauma. Yeah. Um, is, is there any advice that you can give in terms of people helping themselves with longevity? And, um, you know, I don't know about diabetes, but it's maybe quite similar to people who have got diabetes. Um, do you have any advice in terms of staying well? But yeah, I think... I, the, that's a difficult one, and uh, I mean, follicular lymphoma is, a, is, is, is really a chronic illness now, and um, for some patients, if you, if you have your upfront chemotherapy and you haven't relapsed at two years, you, you've got a complete remission at two years, your life expectancy is pretty much the same as a normal population. Um, so, you know, that's, that's changed quite a lot. The, the advice I always give people um, about lifestyle and what have you. There's, there's no one or two things that actually makes a big difference as far as your disease is concerned. But being fit's a good thing. So being, being fit, physically fit's a good thing. Not smoking's a good thing. And, and the reason I say that is if, if, you, if you come and see me uh, and you are fit, then I, all my options are on the table. If you come and see me and you're 130 kilograms, you smoke and you've got diabetes and what have you because of, the, because of your obesity, that really impairs what I can do for you. So being fit makes you know, the treatment options that much more easy. So being fit, be a little bit careful about, I imagine being here is very similar to back home. There's all sorts of claims for you know, this diet, that and the other that, that cure cancer or make things better. Anything that's an extreme is probably not something to pursue. You know, um, oh, I'm all for it. <laughs> is, that, is that the right answer? Yeah. <laughs> <It's> not, <laughs> if, you, if, if, you, if your doctor says don't drink alcohol, get a second opinion, that's for sure. <laughs> Uh, it, it's the same story, you know, it's everything in moderation. You know, if you drink lots and lots of alcohol, then your liver's a bit, you know, struggling a bit. And if I give you a drug, and lots of these drugs are metabolized by your liver, then, then that causes cause problems. That goes for some of the alternative therapies as well, by the way. You know, some of these things, they, they might appear safe or because you're not being prescribed and doesn't necessarily mean that your body's not having to metabolize these things. So 
any, everything in moderation, my dad always used to say, although he didn't practice that. He, he died of lung cancer, he wouldn't stop smoking, so uh, it's, it's, not, it's not the best role model. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't, a, anything that's an extreme, I think, is, is not right. So drinking, if you want to drink, drink, yeah. But, being, but not drinking, you might feel better for it. I usually do. Well, it depends what kind of immunotherapy you're talking about. We, we know in follicular lymphoma, that adding rituximab, so that's immunotherapy, improves the outcome from the chemotherapy alone. We know that. So there's no question that adding the immune component to the chemotherapy, whatever the chemotherapy is, is going to improve outcomes. It's a slightly different story about whether you continue with immunotherapy after the chemotherapy, and there's big sort of debates about whether that is is a good thing to do. Most of us do it. So in the UK, well, this is talking about something called maintenance. So you give the chemotherapy, then you give rituximab. Uh, we give it subcutaneously for up to two years. Um, and that improves what's called progression-free survival. What does that mean? That means that you will, you will live longer without a disease coming back than if you do have it. But it doesn't make you live any longer. So ultimately, your survival, if you like, is the same um, for various reasons. So it, one of the things about immunotherapy is tailoring it. Um, who gets the most benefit from it? And so there's a study that's just started in the UK. It's actually running in Australia as well, where we're taking people with follicular lymphoma who need treatment, giving them chemotherapy with rituximab, but then doing a PET scan at the end. And if they are PET negative, in other words, there's no obvious disease, then they're getting randomized. So by chance, they're getting immunotherapy or nothing. Because those patients might be the ones that don't need it. And you, with all treatments, you don't get something for nothing. So if you give immunotherapy rituximab for a couple of years, there's, a, there's an incidence of chronic infections. It just lowers your immune system. They're not severe infections. They don't kill you. But I'm regularly stopping rituximab for patients who've got chronic sinus problems or chronic chest problems. And it's not benefiting them if that's impairing your quality of life. So I think it's, um, again, with lymphoma, it's, it's very much individualized how you manage it. There are certain situations where this is the treatment. You know, there's no question this is the treatment. But, you know, immunotherapy post-chemo is, is an individual decision. So my practice in a sort of more elderly population who don't have very much disease in the first place, I won't do it because all I'm going to do is introduce toxicity. Their survival is so long with the disease, they're going to die something else, to put it bluntly. So what I don't want to do is introduce toxicity with the therapies I'm going to give them. In a younger patient, uh, I might be more inclined to use a rituximab painted setting, particularly if they've got bulky disease, just if they've got a lot of disease to start with, because um, they're probably going to—they're the ones that are probably going to get the most benefit from it. Yeah, so um, obinutuzumab, or GA101, um, is a sort of super rituximab. Again, um, doesn't make you live any longer than rituximab. Has some issues. I mean, it's quite difficult to. Uh, um, give lots of infusion reactions uh, and more infections again um, that's available in the UK but very few people are using it actually they're more likely to be using rituximab because rituximab is a much easier drug to give can you give sub rituximab here oh, yeah. yeah I mean so subcutaneous rituximab is such a nice thing for patients so again it's 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 slightly better probably for a progression-free survival perspective, but it's very minor actually. So it's not, it's not a slam dunk. It's not, if you like, the next big thing. Uh, there are some situations where it might be better. In, in, a, in a relapse situation, when patients have had a, a, a shorter remission from their rituximab-based treatment, that, that may well be beneficial there. But that's not many patients. Yeah. There you go, immunotherapy. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. Um, so, I mean, You've been watching, watched, are you? Watching and waiting. Yeah. Um, but also, my doctor said um, you probably won't be comfortable with this. Get a second opinion. And he was. Uh, He's a good doctor then. Yeah. Um, and I happened to get it off a chap who's up here in Mana, and he suggested, well, why not try some radiation? You've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. So that's. I don't have a clear picture, and maybe no one has. I'm just curious what might be down the track. So, so uh, mantle cell lymphoma, for those that don't know, is an aggressive type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And if you, know, if you, if you see, it's an aggressive form of mantle cell lymphoma. It's a disease that men get, not women, predominantly. 
uh, three to one men to women. Uh, it's an aggressive disease, but there is a group of patients, as I said earlier, who've got a, a very indolent dis behaving disease. It just sort of jogs along in the background. And I've got some patients untreated for 10 years. Uh, the trouble with this lymphoma is there's, no, there's nothing you can measure that will predict you, what's going to happen to you. And so leaving people alone is, is often the right thing to do because you might be surprised. You know, if you're treated straight away, then you, you get a response. If you leave alone, you have no idea. And, you, you, and you, it doesn't affect how long you live. That's the important thing. And a big change with that disease is, is, is a move away from chemotherapy to these non-chemotherapy approaches. So as I said, we're running this study of ibrutinib, a tablet, with rituximab, subcutaneous, as treatment for an aggressive lymphoma versus chemotherapy. So it's a randomized trial. Um, I mean, it'll be a few years before we know the answer to that, but that, that style of treatment away from a chemotherapy approach, I think we're gonna see that you know, further on down the track. One of the other things I always um, tell patients is that um, you know, waiting until you need treatment, for, for, not for all lymphomas, some lymphomas you've gotta jump on them straight away, the, the, the more aggressive ones is a good thing because basically, the, the, you know, in, in a broad way, the longer you live, the longer you are waiting for new innovations to appear. So I've got patients in my clinic who came to see me six years ago when everything had failed, who've been on a six series of clinical trials and, and have gone from one drug to the next and are fine. So these things are all, uh, you know, they, they, the pharmaceutical industry get a real kick in, but actually that's where drugs come from. And, and they're, they're inventing new drugs all the time. And, and good drugs with few side effects are going to sell. So actually, you know, these things are coming. And um, it's, it, it's an exciting place. Ten years ago, there was nothing in, for, for, for the condition you're talking about. And now there's lots of potential things. So that was the right thing to do. If you've got local disease, a bit of radiotherapy is a good idea as well. You've got a good doctor. Yeah. <laughs> Two of them, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. H. pylori, yeah. yeah. Invented in Australia, that was, you know. You can. Yeah, you can. Doesn't he? Okay. Well, he's, he's not right. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so H. pylori is a, is a, is a bug Man, most of us are exposed to, and in some patients it can, it can induce a, a rare type of lymphoma in the stomach. And, and what's interesting is if you treat the H. pylori with antibiotics, the lymphoma goes away. So one of the things with lymphoma is that cr anything that sort of chronically stimulates your immune system can lead to some types of lymphoma. And if you remove the stimulus, the lymphoma can go away. So the Lymphoma, unlike most of the solid cancers, lung cancer, bowel cancer, breast cancer, is sort of very involved with your immune system. So, for example, if you've had a kidney transplant and you, you are constantly being immunosuppressed, you have to take immunosuppressive drugs to stop your body from rejecting the kidney, your incidence of lymphoma goes right up because you're basically calming your immune system down. If you get lymphoma and you stop the immunosuppression, the lymphoma goes away. So this, this, this play between your immune system and your lymphoma is important. In some disease, not all of them, but in some of them it is. And that's why lymphoma is common as you get older, because your immune system is not quite as smart as it is when you're younger. But yeah, H. pylori causes certain types of lymphoma. Also causes stomach cancer. He should know that. Anyway. <laughs> A little bit, I wouldn't worry. With inland lymphoma, I wouldn't worry about a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. <laughs> what else? Yeah. We have some online questions. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, can Good. we steal your microphone? Of course you can. Because you can use that. All right. Yeah, yeah. I'm loud <laughs> enough anyway, aren't I? Yeah. Thank you, Simon. So leading on, um, I've put them into themes here and there's something quite similar to that lady's question. So you've answered about those particular viruses, but are there any other viruses with um, follicular or mantle cell, like we see um, the correlation between EBV, say with Hodgkin's lymphoma and Burkitt's? Is there anything else that we, we know about or are looking into um, that may oh. cause I mean, the short answer is no. Yeah. You know, uh, you've, you just described the sort of the, the most frequent ones. 
know, hepatitis C can then cause some, some rare lymphomas, but by and large, no. We, you know, we don't recognize, um, for, for most lymphomas, we have no idea what triggers it. You know, we, we, we know it's common as we get older. Uh, we know there are some particular situations I just described, if you're immunosuppressed, that it's more likely to happen. But no, outside of things you described, there's no, there's no clear um, <coughs> causative agent. And, and I guess, I mean, lymphomas, like many cancers, there's, there's probably two elements here. There's something that triggers something that goes wrong in your body, and there's something in your body that doesn't actually recognize it, and so things uh, take off. So, you know, you can live in the same house, eat the same food, be under the same overhead power lines, not all that causes problems, and somebody gets a disease and the other one doesn't. So why is that? You know, there's, there's some environmental insult, probably, that triggers it, and that might just be that might just be aging. It might just be you know age, and then there's something about you that when this happens, it triggers it triggers a, a disease. But we don't know. We don't. And, and um, the, the bottom line, and this you know sounds a bit flippant. It's not meant to be. It's bad luck. You know, you get these things. It is just bad luck. There's nothing that you have done for yourself. Uh, I've got a I've got a patient who's um, who's a, a psychological mess. He's a he's a he's an American guy. Not that that's an issue. Um, <laughs> And uh, he's, uh, he's, he was on the front page of Men's Health magazine about 10 years ago. He's an absolute specimen of a bloke. He's, 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 he's ripped. And he was a, he was a semi-professional American football player. He's, he's lived on green tea. He's vegetarian. He's never smoked, never had a drink in his life, and he gets mantle cell lymphoma. And psychologically, that's destroyed him because his entire life was focused on being super healthy so these things wouldn't happen to him. Uh, and can I persuade him to have a drink? No. So he's, he, he's, <laughs> he's continuing with this lifestyle despite, I mean, I've treated him and it's all gone away. Uh, but psychologically, that's really hard for this guy because his whole you know, being, I mean, he's very fit. And to go back to the point I said earlier, the fact that he's really fit means I can do anything I like. He's had a bone marrow transplant. Um, but yeah, that's, that's quite difficult really for him. We do have a, another few questions around, you were talking about like, looking at um, predictors for the future, so the genetic testing, you're talking yeah. about a, a clinical trial that you've got, because um, obviously there are, in other lymphomas, I suppose, there's um, ways we're looking into, can we predict how a lymphoma may act in the future, yeah. but also are there um, genetic testing in sort of follicular and mantle cell that we're sort of looking into, and that's the study you were saying? Well, yes, I mean, I, I, was, I was just presenting some of that yeah. stuff. I mean. Again, one of the principles of medicine, uh, and this is for you patients to, uh, to listen to, I guess, and agree or otherwise, is never do a test unless you're going to act on the results of it. So if you do a test and you find something, what are you going to do? And so we recognize some prognostic factors in certain lymphomas, but it makes no difference how I'm going to treat you. So actually, do you really want to know that your prognosis is worse than if you have this mutation or that mutation? Some people do, uh, but it makes no difference what I'm going to do. And the other thing is statistics are meaningless to the individual, okay? So if I said you've got a one in a hundred chance of being cured with this disease and you're that one person, great. But you know, you've spent five years, you know, worrying about it. They're, so they're only useful, these tests, if, if I find you've got this, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do something different. So we've just recognized this year in the context of mantle cell lymphoma, and this will not be you, I can promise you, uh, there's a certain mutation that we recognize is confers a really bad prognosis. So these patients, when we give them treatment, they'll progress early. You give them treatment, it's not gonna work very well. Even the new drugs don't very, work very well. So we can see that now. It's a very small proportion of patients, but in those people, we need to do something different. And now we've got something different we can do, it's, 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 worth, it's worth checking it. Because previously what we do is we just treat people, and if they, if, they did, if they responded well, fine. If they didn't respond well, then we do something else. Uh, so you just kind of gave it and s saw what happens. Now we can do something different, then we should do something different. Um, but there, are, there aren't very many examples of where there's a test we're going to do that's going to actually inform how we manage people. For as long as I've been a consultant, and that's a long time, there's been this dream that you're going to do a gene expression profile on somebody. You'll take the tumor, you'll do a, you'll do a whole gene profile, it'll tell you the diagnosis, it'll tell you what treatment to give, and it'll tell you what side effects you're going to get from the treatment still not happen. It probably won't happen because actually, it's a, you know, very, we're very complicated humans, you know, uh, we're not, we're not uh, tissue, tissue culture and lots of things interact and, and affect how uh, treatments go. So that might be the future. Uh, it might certainly be um, 
It might be more useful for when it comes from a diagnostic point of view, because looking at genes is far more black and white than a, than a pathologist looking at um, cells down the microscope. So it might be helpful in a diagnostic perspective, but right now it's not actually helping how we manage. But, but perhaps what I talked about today will be the first of, and there may be others, there may be others. The other thing is there are, there are drugs that target specific mutations. That's, we're starting to see that. And so there's starting to be a rationale for maybe if you find this mutation, use that drug. But there really aren't very many. And um, BTK inhibitors, which is the drug I've spent a lot of time developing or working with, target something called BTK, Bruton's tyrosine kinase, which is completely normal in patients with, with a lymphoma. It's normal. So it's not mutated. It's not abnormal in any way. So it's targeting a totally normal protein. So if you did a gene expression profile, you would never have found anything abnormal there. It's just a very sensitive pathway, which you only find out when you give the drug and see what happens. So maybe we'll see the few. I'm, I'm increasingly skeptical about some of these things. That's what happens when you get a bit older. Definitely. And that leads into another question from one of our patients. So um, like you said, Simon, you're not going to do a test, only doing a test if you're acting on it. So a yeah. lot of patients sent through questions, for example, with standard follow-ups at the moment. So you might have one patient been told you know, a CT PET scan for six months, yeah. um, every six months for two years, and then we don't scan. And obviously a lot of patients at that point are Get like, worried. if you're not scanning and you can't yeah. tell in my blood tests whether yeah. I've got my follicular or mantle cell back, how, you know, it's, it's not very reassuring, I suppose, for them. But like you said, if you're not going to act on that, if they have yeah. got symptoms. Do you know, a lot of that is, is explained to the patient right at the beginning what you're going to do and why you're going to do it. So I'm going to treat you like this, and when that's finished, this is what's going to happen. So, for example, when I first moved to my hospital, we had hundreds of patients being followed up with aggressive lymphoma, most of whom were cured. And they were coming every six months or every year, and it, you know, it was a very pleasant conversation because they think you're great and you know, they're, they're normal. Um, but then none of them needed to be there. You know, they all shouldn't be there. They should be out. In fact, there was one guy who was really upset when I discharged him from the clinic because because he'd wanted to emigrate to New Zealand. And because he was coming regularly to hospital, albeit, albeit every six months, he was not allowed to emigrate. So he was really quite angry with my predecessor. So now if you come to me with diffuse large B cell, you're going to get this. And after two years, I'm going to discharge you. So everybody, when they get there, they know that's the situation. They're not anxious. It's just in that trans, you know, that, that, the, the, the time when you're changing your kind of follow-up policy. And that's, I think that's happening around the world because basically we're curing more people, so we've got more patients in our clinic. But, but one, of the, one of the things you need to do is get people back to normality. And part of being normal is not coming to hospital for whatever reason. So it, it takes you out of that mindset that I've got an illness because I'm being reminded every six months because I come to hospital to I'm fine, I don't need to come to hospital. And with the, uh, with the indolent diseases, doing scans in something that's completely normal, clinically normal, is of no value because I'm not going to treat somebody like that. I, it, you've got to be unwell before I'm going to treat you. So that's the point, I'm going to do the scan. So my practice is not to routinely do these things, but wait until the patient gives me a trigger to do it. That's not, you know, certainly, certainly North American practice isn't that. And I suspect some Australian practice won't be that, you know, regularly scanning people. But then patients start to expect a scan, and if you don't get a scan, you get anxious because you haven't had a scan. It's all what your conditions towards. But you know, I just come back to what I said earlier. I'm not going to do a test unless I'm going to act on it. Um, and the, the, the other thing that we're looking at, particularly follicular lymphoma, actually, because a lot of patients with follicular lymphoma are going to be fine for donkey's years, you know, decades. I'd rather you told me when you're not right and I'll see you then rather than me seeing you when you're well. So having a kind of a slightly different follow-up approach, we put the onus on the patient. If you're not right, these are things I want you to worry about. And if you've got that, you come and see me. You're gonna have the same things as everybody else. So I'm not your GP. Don't come and see me for everything because I'll be rubbish at that. But these are the kind of things I want to know about. Or alternatively, go and see your GP. If he's worried, he rings me, I'll see you straight away. So having a kind of, this is what we've got now, a kind of open access clinic where the patient will actually ring my clinical nurse specialist, uh, usually having, they've having, she usually advise them to see the GP if it's all a bit non-specific. And if, if there's an anxiety, then we'll see them, see you straight away. And, and that's a much better use of resource than you coming every six months, because we know, certainly with most lymphomas, you're gonna tell me when you relapse, I'm not gonna tell you. And routine follow-up, and certainly routine scanning, almost always misses it. 
you know, so the scan will be normal. So we, nobody scans anybody. Well, I've got to be careful what I say now. Um, aggressive lymphoma, you don't scan people. There's no point because the, the trials have been done regularly scanning people rather than waiting for the patient to get symptoms. Because you do a scan today, it's normal. Six weeks later, the disease can be back. It's a waste of time. And the other thing, again, coming back to what I said earlier, you don't get something for nothing. A CT scans a lot of X-ray uh, exposure. If you're going to live 20, 30 years with follicular lymphoma and you're having CT scans every six months, you're going to get acute leukemia from all the X-ray exposure. So you don't, want to, you don't want to do that. So it's all balance. Have I scared people now? <laughs> no, no, no. So for the, um, for the indolent lymphomas, early treatment makes no difference. So if you're asymptomatic, I'm not going to treat you. You've got no symptoms at all, I'm not going to treat you. So I'm, going to, I'm not going to treat you until you've got disease-causing problems. And the other thing with uh, follicular lymphoma, which is well described, which sounds a bit odd, is it can go away by itself you can get spontaneous remissions with follicular lymphoma. Unexplained. It's not due to any particular, you know, living under a pyramid, having coffee enemas or anything. And it just, it happens. So leaving people alone is often a very good thing to do. Yeah. Yes, sir. Wow. That was a smart move, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's true, but it's the kind of, it's the balance. And um, PET scans often c cause more problems than they, than they solve, because you see things and you don't know what the hell it is. Um, but the, the, the trouble with regular scanning is the, the potential it can cause harm, if you like. Not just the, the chronic exposure to radiation. You might actually pick up things that you end up having, biopsy here, biopsy there, and it's, it was nothing to worry about. Yeah. It's a difficult balance, you know, but... Um, yeah. And, and again, because of when you were diagnosed, your kind of expectations of how this is managed are completely different than if you were diagnosed today. So if you were diagnosed today and you saw me, you wouldn't be worried about scans because it, it wouldn't be part of the conversation. Yeah. Whereas now it is, you know, you've, you've got that legacy of how you've been managed, so that's an expect, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, I've got, I've got patients like yourself who find that reassurance and, and I'll do it because it, one, of the, one of the things that's important in some patients and this isn't you, the people, some people get really, really anxious and they, found, they find the scan extremely reassuring, just as coming to clinic can be. So I said I discharged all these patients. Some patients I can't discharge because they find the reassurance of coming to clinic, even though it's, it's just a process where you stick your hand on their tummy and say everything's fine, that for them is the reassurance they need to get on with life. And I have no problem with that because that psychological, you know, help is of value for them. And, and, and what you're doing as a doctor is treating all of you, not just the, the, just not the lumps, it's all of you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm blasé about it. No. Like I'm, 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 I have the understanding that you can't pop in for sure and get a bottle of pills and get over it. Yeah. Um, there's something that I'm certainly mindful of, but it doesn't take over my life. No. And I just follow the guidance of my, my physician. And yeah. He's happy with the progress I am to. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't argue with that. Oh, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> I um, noted recently there was a court case in America where it was found that um, glyphosate had caused the uh, leukemia. Or was it lymphoma? Weed killer. Lymphoma yeah, yeah. Of this um, groundsman. Mm. Um, which, as I was watching Four Corners, uh, who, you know, did this in more depth, and part of that show. genetically modified um, gene from the 
same manufacturer so that it's not, I guess, in any way affected in its growing. Or, but it concerned me that somewhere along the food chain I could ingest corn that was sprayed with glyphosate. And yeah, I'd, I don't know. I mean, I think... Uh, if anything, I don't, think you, I think, I don't think you can do anything about it. And, and, and you know, how, how much that is actually linked to the generality of lymphoma, I think it's, it's, it's unlikely. I think if, you are, if you're in that profession, you're exposed to a lot of these things. And I think it's the, maybe it's the, 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 the actual amount of exposure is the issue rather than the, rather than the agent itself. Um, but, you know, it's out of your control and my control. But, but we're not seeing, an, you know, an exponential rise in, in, in lymphoma as a consequence of people, you know, changing eating habits. Uh, you know, you don't see any difference in vegetarians or non-vegetarians or certain diets. Uh, even actually, I mean, you do get some racial variance. So if you look at the incidence of lymphomas across the world, certain lymphomas are more common, for example, in Southeast Asia than they are in the Western world. So mantle cell, I've been to China four times now. When I first went there, mantle cell lymphoma didn't exist. Never saw it. You go there now, there's loads of it. It's not that the disease wasn't there, it's just they're diagnosing it now. So, you know, as, 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 as medicine gets better, you start seeing these things. But it's, it's very difficult. And one of the things that, um, again, that I see regularly is, you, you know, you, you are suddenly diagnosed with lymphoma. You know, why did this happen to me? That's your first question. So you're going to think, well, I had a car crash two years ago. I got divorced a year ago. You know, my mum died. There's something in your life that's stressful that you want to blame on why this has happened. Because uh, that's happened to everybody. Everybody's had a stressful event. So you're looking for something that might have caused it. It's human nature, you know. Why, why would this happen to me? Uh, and I guess diet's another component to that. Um, as I said before, it's bad luck for just about everybody. Um, but, you know, this human nature to try and find a cause. But I, I don't know the whole uh, story behind that. You know, and, and, and inducing cancers in a test tube is very easy with lots of things. It's, it's slightly different in a, in a, in a two-legged model, slightly different. There are also a couple of farmers who got um, lymphoma. Yeah. So I've got a, uh, um, so I work in Plymouth, which is a big rural part of the world, so Devon and Cornwall, and we don't see more lymphoma in farmers than non non farmers. You know, if it was if it was truly um, an occupational thing, you'd see it, and we don't see it. So, and again, it's what I said earlier: it's one thing being exposed to something like that. There's something that that exposure, something about you that having been exposed, it triggers it triggers an event. So, it's it's never quite as simple as it as it might be made out to be. So you take smoking, for example, 50% of smokers live a completely normal life, 50%, 50% don't. So, you know, you take the most carcinogenic thing there is, cancer inducing thing there is, and only half people get cancer or problems, but half do. So if you want to, it's not a lottery ticket you want to buy that, is it? Um, I was just wondering about your opinion on stem cell retrieval as an insurance policy for recurrence. Yeah, don't. Sorry? Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Is that, is that the why? answer? Why, why, well, why would you? You mean collect your stem cells? Yeah. Yeah, because... Uh, be, be, no, because um, if you're going to do it, you, you, you take the stem cells at the time you're going to be doing it. You don't need to, you don't need to be storing them down. It's of no benefit to you. Wouldn't do it. But, the, you know, they used to do what was called rainy day harvests. We used to, you know, do a transfer and store it. We never used them. And, you know, we're there for years and years and years and years. And actually, if I've got some stem cells stored for 10 years, and I've got you, I'll actually take your stem cells right now, thanks, rather than ones that have been sticking the, stuck in the freezer for 10 years. Because when I thaw them out, half of them will die. So, you know, you, you, want, them, you want them in you. Now, you might say, well, there's gonna, there might be some tumour in there, but there might have been back there as well. So, no, you want, you, you want the, the stem cells around the time that, uh, that you're going to do it. Now, you might say, I might be too old for that. Well, if you're too old for it, it's the chemotherapy that is the, is the thing that, that uh, pre precludes you from having the stem cell transplant, not having the stem cells. So to have a stem cell transplant, you have to have high-dose chemotherapy. So if you're, you know, old, but you've got stored stem cells, I'm, I'm not going to do it because it's the chemotherapy that's going to knock you off. So I would, uh, I would not do it if I was you. I thought the idea was so that because follicular gets harder to treat each time it recurs, so they give you more heavy-duty chemotherapy, and then if you've got the stem cells <coughs> sitting there, they can 
wipe out your bone marrow with a strong chemo and then give you the stem cells back? No, you, you, do, you do that type of treatment very rarely in follicular lymphoma. And, and you'll only tend to do that in a young person whose disease is behaving in a very aggressive way. So if you give standard chemotherapy, whatever it is, and the disease is back within a year, say, then you're going to dial it up a little bit because you know in that situation being more intensive is going to buy you. Uh, it's going to be more, more, uh, better for you. Things are, things are evolving in follicular lymphoma. I mean, the average survival of follicular lymphoma now is 20 years, you know, and, and the frontline treatment is going to buy you remissions of seven, eight years these days. And, and that's 20 years based on treatment 20 years ago. So the drugs I'm playing with in clinic are the things that might be available in 10 years from now. So there's a whole evolving field, and stem cell transplant is a pretty crude thing to do. It's just basically high-dose chemotherapy. That's all it is. It's high-dose chemotherapy, uh, which would ordinarily kill you because it wipe out your bone marrow. So you take your stem cells out so you can dose up the chemotherapy, and then you, the stem cells go back to rescue you. That's all it is. It's nothing, nothing clever. It's just a trick to give you high-dose chemotherapy. Mm. But you only do that in a young person whose disease is behaving in a, in a very aggressive way, more like an aggressive <coughs> lymphoma. Right. And I'll have your stem cells right now, thank you, rather than stuff that was stored 10 years ago. If you had, if you had cells 10, 10 years ago, you haven't got disease that's behaving like that anyway. So I wouldn't. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't be. Just listen to what I said. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've just got a few questions for, there's a lot of follicular patients online yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, then would you now see the follicular patient, you're, if you're not using stem cell transplants, we've now got enough of new treatments, that, so it's just um, a pathway of new treatments rather than the harsher stem cell? I think so. I mean, what, one of the challenges with follicular lymphoma is how you sequence your therapies, because what you want to do is keep patients as, alive as long as possible with as good a quality of life as possible. So part of that is not over-treating people. Part of that is leaving people alone. Part of that is waiting until they've got disease that actually requires some kind of treatment. There are a range of chemotherapies that work. You, you know, you can choose one or the other depending on how the disease is behaving, uh, how old the patient is, what kind of other problems they've got. Um, and, you know, some of the gentler forms of treatment you can use again. So you can give say CVP, it's a very British thing to do, but if you give that to somebody and the patient will lapse seven years' time, you can do it again. So it's, again, it's how you sequence these things. Uh, the, the, the new drugs in follicular lymphoma, things called PI3 kinase inhibitors, have all been um, dogged with, with side effects. They've been, they're active, but they cause side effects. There are new ones coming. They've got fewer side effects. These are tablets uh, that look active. We, we don't yet know how best to use them. Um, I mean, I'm doing trials with these drugs right now. So there's lots of these things coming. Follicular lymphoma, because it tends to come back and back, there's a, there's a, there's a, the, you know, there's a, there's a big industry out there trying to, trying to create new drugs. Um, we often, a common question for us too is frontline treatment. What yeah. is the best treatment? Bearing in mind Australia is probably ahead of the UK, um, you know, with what you, we You can't have. give maintenance, though, can you? I don't think we are, but anyway. Um, so I think, yeah, the patients, uh, patients are often given options yeah. themselves and it's obviously very difficult for a patient to make that um, option. So what would you use in the UK, frontline? We've got the same drugs that you have, by the way, frontline. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, we are. <laughs> well, we just got, yeah, more listed. But what would your, what is your, say, preferred option frontline and okay. then at relapse? So it's, it's, it, 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 it's what I said before. It, it, it depends on the patient, their age, their fitness, how the disease is be behaving, how it presents. So in a young patient with disease that's, that's moving pretty quickly, patients are, well, I'll use CHOP. Uh, and because uh, I think that gives you you know what you're going to get with CHOP. It works very well. It's the treatment you use for aggressive lymphoma. So if there's any suggestion that that disease has progressed in any way, you've got a transformation, then that's the right thing to do. Bendamustine may be as good as CHOP. It's got a slightly better side effect profile, but it does have late effects that CHOP doesn't have. So infections can be an issue with bendamustine, and there could be some deaths from bendamustine late. So it's a balance. And the reality is you're probably going to use both of those agents at some point. So it's how you sequence them. So again, it depends on the individual patient in front of you. So there's no right answer. There's no, you, you must use this treatment for everybody for lymphoma. You've got a range of three or four things that you could use, including rituximab by itself. So just single agent rituximab in some patients with low volume disease or elderly patients or a little bit of radiotherapy. There are, there are things that you can use that uh, will work and you're more inclined to use that in an older, frailer patient than say a, a young 
fit patient where you, you might want to be a little bit more aggressive because you're going to buy more time then. And it's about what you're trying to achieve with your therapy. Because we're not curing people with follicular lymphoma, but we're, we're, you're in it for the long haul. So in a young patient, you want that remission to be as long as possible, so you'll be inclined to be a bit more aggressive. But in an older patient, you don't want to cause problems with your treatment. I think that's really reassuring um, mm -hmm. for patients to hear that because we can be sitting in a room with 10 patients and, and they've all been treated got differently. a different treatment yeah, and then yeah. you're worrying about that. So I guess the message is that, yeah, it sounds like you can actually be treated based on you, the individual, and getting back to your previous comment, have a second opinion if you yeah. just want to be reassured yeah. that you are heading in the right direction. So, I, I, you know, I can see five new follicular lymphoma patients in a row and treat them all differently, you know, and one... You know, excluding watching, which you, you're going to do if patients don't have any problems, you can be you, might, you like to be more aggressive. And a young patient's got nasty disease causing problems, and an older patient you want to be quite gentle. So it, it's very individual. So there's no right answer. It's not like diffuse large B cell where there's one treatment. It's R chop, you know. And if you can't tolerate that, then you're going to use modified R chop or something. But that's that's you know, wherever you're in the world, that's the treatment. But that's a very unusual scenario. Most lymphomas aren't like that. You know, you're going, to, you're going to base it around the patient sitting in front of you. Would you do the same then with mental cell? Would that be the same advice? Yeah. Or would stem cell transplant then yeah, come I think, more I th into Yeah, and no, I, think, I think mental cell's broadly similar, actually. Mental cell falls into two groups. Well, at, at the point you need to treat somebody, so forget the watching. At the point you need to treat somebody, in a young patient, you're going to be aggressive. You're going to give them a high-dose chemotherapy approach with a transplant and rituxpub maintenance, which you can't get over here, but we can. Working uh, on it. <laughs> yeah, it makes you live longer. Yeah, uh, and that's that's the right, and that's pretty much standard of care across the world. The chemotherapy bit can vary. There are three or four different varieties of chemotherapy. It's all wrapped around the same drug that's the key drug, cytarabine. So it probably doesn't matter which of those you use, but that's the treatment of choice for for an older patient population. And it's either chop based or bendamustine based treatment, and they're broadly equivalent. But again, you're going to you're going to use these drugs. You're going to use both of those drugs probably in the lifetime of the patient. It's, it's how you sequence them. And because you're an expert in the mantle cell, I guess, is a message to Australia that we're actually disadvantaged because of that rituximab maintenance you are. that we currently don't There's have. There's no question. There's yeah, no question. There okay. are very, That's... very, very few drugs yeah. that have proven a survival benefit in mantle cell lymphoma. Mm. But rituximab maintenance is one of them uh, after transplant. And in fact, there's a, there's, a, there's a big series just published from the Czech uh, group looking at survival across the board in mantle cell lymphoma, maintenance versus no maintenance, and there's a huge difference in outcome. Yeah, I think I've seen huge that. Huge difference. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's something that we really need to address yeah, here. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Any more questions? Because I've taken over the microphone. Don't address it for me. No, no, I don't have a question. I've used up mine. Sorry, I'm from Roche. <laughs> um, it's just with bendamustine, it's not reimbursed, that theory of maintenance. Yeah, with, well, actually... With CHOP, it is. Is it? But it's not post-transplant, it's not. Okay. Because that, that, that's where the survival benefit is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Post-bendamustine, there's no benefit, so there's, there's, yeah. there is no point. Post-CHOP, there is. Uh, in fact, I use CHOP followed by maintenance rather than bendamustine frontline in mantle cell, because I think you, you get much more for your... Your treatment than if you give Bender. I use Bender Mustine later. Oh, it works very well. So it's a, again, it's about how you sequence things. But post Bender Mustine, there's no evidence that rituximab adds anything in any setting. So there's no there's, there's no reason to fund it. So <laughs> you might disagree. Yeah. Look, I'll, I'll just jump in there and just provide the Australian sort of landscape. So in fact, under our arrangements for reimbursement for rituximab, the PBS makes a distinction between induction chemotherapy with rituximab included as part of that and then giving rituximab by itself as maintenance treatment. So at the moment for any B-cell lymphoma, doesn't matter what subtype it is, as long as it's got the protein that rituximab binds to, which is CD20, then you can use rituximab in combination with chemotherapy. And now with um, follicular lymphoma, we can use gaziva as well as an alternate in that, in that situation. For maintenance therapy, we can only do it for follicular lymphoma specifically. Um, it doesn't allow us to do it for mantle cell lymphoma or diffuse large cell lymphoma. So within the lymphoma space, maintenance treatment with rituximab is only available in follicular lymphoma. Um, and that's, that's the way it is. 
So, I mean, obviously that's where groups like Lymphoma Australia are very important because they can Absolutely. continue to provide advocacy and yeah. sort of lobby the um, companies and the PBAC to, to ultimately get these things over the line, particularly in a circumstance like this where there is clear evidence of benefit. So yeah. it's a big hole in our current therapeutic strategies. I would also say patient groups are listened to far more than we are. Okay, so I can go and shout, say, you know, demand this, but they assume I'm being funded by Roche or whoever to say that. Of course, you're not, but you, 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 you have you, your vested interests are slightly different. So don't don't underestimate how powerful your voice is. Is there any surprise every breast cancer drug gets funded? You know, because they make a lot of noise. That's why. That's it's the power of the lobby. There's no two ways. It's the same where I am. The power of the lobby. So it's in your hands to, to a degree. Any more questions from I think they're here? all a bit worn out, aren't they? Yeah, sure. well, you've yeah. done any more from Shana with any on there? Yeah, <coughs> all right. Okay, and I guess just um, leading from that, in Australia, we do have a regulatory system um, where our government does value the patient voice, and I think that's where we've been able to have some of our drugs be approved more recently. So it's great to have people like yourselves here and everyone online as well, because the next time a submission or a, um, new medicines are put out, we ask our patients, please go on to the government website, fill in the form and tell them about what your lymphoma is and how these medicines are helping you at the moment or how they could benefit you. So if you have mantle cell lymphoma, and the submissions come up for maintenance, MAB theory or rituximab, we need to hear about it from you. That's how we've been able to get more drugs approved for even the follicular lymphoma. That's been an amazing space. A decade ago, what did we have? R-CHOP. Oh, actually, in Australia, we only had CHOP. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. we moved on to R-CHOP. Now we have patients saying, which one do I have? So we can eliminate some of those harsher therapies yeah. and just go on to the chemotherapies. Yeah. So. Um, but I guess I can, if no more questions here, um, on behalf of Lymphoma Australia, I would like to thank all of you for coming today. This is what we are here for, everyone online. We have people from across Australia listening in. Um, we hope to do these more often and particularly so that we're looking at specific subtypes and that will help each of you with your type of lymphoma. Um, without the wonderful um, expert advice from Doctors Professor Rule and Dr Jason Butler, we wouldn't be able to bring this to you, but we really appreciate the time and the effort that you actually pleasure. share all your knowledge with us. Um, so thank you so much. Um, Absolute pleasure. And we have alcohol. <laughs> Where is well, our well. alcohol? <laughs> so, um, thank but, you for no, yeah, absolutely. thank you. We, um, this is what we do. This is what we want to do. We want to be able to get more medicines to Australians, clinical trials. The other thing is learn about clinical trials. They're the way to the future. In Australia, we are not as so, good as the UK. So let me just tell you, we're about to publish in the British Journal of Hematology. I'm going to blow my own trumpet now. If you were diagnosed with mantle lymphoma in my hospital, you live twice as long as if you're diagnosed in the Yorkshire region of the country, where there's other comprehensive database. And do you know why? It's because 60% of my patients go on clinical trials. 60% go on clinical trials. So ask about a trial. Yeah, definitely. If you have to have travel for a trial, even consider the trial. The patients will travel. Yeah. Doctors are re reluctant to offer them to patients. So I'll tell you an anecdote which is, which is very instructive to me. I saw a guy with mantle cell lymphoma. He failed three lines of treatment. He drove to see me from Manchester. Now that, to Plymouth, that's, if you don't know, that's a long way, right? So he's five and a half, six hours in the car. Very ordinary bloke, wasn't wealthy or anything. He turned up and I said to him, look, uh, it's very difficult. I've got a trial of, of a drug, but you know, you'd have to come once a week and that's a lot. And he looked at me and he said, that's for me to decide, not you, isn't it? So, and he came every week and he lived five years, that guy. He went on a trip, it's Len Lidmide, then he got on a brute nib. So, so, you know, you offer it to the patient, they decide whether they're going to invest in that or not. And, and that was a big lesson to me because I think most doctors take the, take the view that it's too much for the patient. Well, ask the patient and they'll tell you. And that's what we should do. It's a good question.
not on the radar, there's not much money being spent, there's not much, not many <laughs> Simply untrue. That was yeah. not 12 months ago. Yeah. So it's difficult. So, so in the UK, so the Lymphoma Association in the UK is a central place where people could ring and they'll tell you. They'll tell you. So they've, they've, they've organised that now. So you've got mantle cell lymphoma, you live there, the trials are here. Yeah. And these We've, are the trials. In Australia, I think full lymphoma now at the moment, we have a couple of good ways. We have what's called ClinRefer app. You can actually download an app and it will actually, you punch in mantle cell locations and up will come the different trials. What happens though, sometimes from a patient perspective, is you look at it and you go, oh my gosh, what does that mean to me? The next point of call can be, ring us. We now have lymphoma nurses on a hotline and they can actually help direct you yeah. to what is it, the trial that might be suitable for you, and then you can actually go and ask your doctor. But also remember, one thing is, when you're sitting with your doctor, say, what ask, clinical trials are available for me? If you don't ask, but at least if you're asking, and if you go away and find one, come back and ask about that one as well. We've now got 500 nurses that have registered up to Lymphoma Australia across Australia. And one of the big things that we want to do is educate them about clinical trials so they can tell their patients about them as well. But we're getting there, but yeah, I think you, UK is yeah. probably further It's, it's very centralised and yeah. organised, yeah. But again, thank you so much. No, it's yes. a pleasure. Yes, yeah, so this is your wine. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, so nice. Very good, I'll take So now he's labelled the yeah, Australia. So yeah. I'll show that to the Lymphoma Association back home. Yeah, so, well, yeah, they haven't got any bags. We, we do a lot of work with them as yeah. well. So we're all part of the Lymphoma Coalition. So um, I thank you and, so uh, much. Well done for the work well. you do. It's yeah. very, very good. Thank you. Thank you.